Hello guys and welcome back. If you are new around here, I cover mostly Australian cases and today we are covering another solved case. And by the way, if you did miss my announcement video yesterday, check it out because I now have a podcast called Koala Crimes. So you can listen to today's case on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. So this case is actually a local case to me here in Perth and happened just 15 years ago. And it's also been quite a controversial case for many reasons. For one, the laws in place at the time almost allowed a killer to get away with his crimes. Then there was the rumor that the perpetrator was actually Robert Thompson, the 10-year-old boy who killed two-year-old James Bolger in the UK back in 1993. But before we get into it, I want to thank today's sponsor, and that is Skillshare. Thank you once again for working with me. And if you have not heard of Skillshare, it's an online learning community that offers thousands of different classes where you can learn a new skill, find a new hobby, and interact with like-minded people. Their classes range from organization, graphic design, painting, illustration, cooking, business, if you can think of it, I think Skillshare probably has it. So as I said, I very recently started a podcast and let me tell you, learning the podcasting platform was a struggle. It's <laughs> nothing like YouTube. And that's when I found the wonderful Don Lego Marcino. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, and his class, how to make a podcast, plan, record, and launch with success. So John is literally an audio producer and head of production at Anchor. So he knows what he is talking about. His lessons were interesting, informative, and straight to the point. In one hour, I felt like I had pretty much learnt all the basics of setting up my own podcast. But I guess you guys can let me know what you think of the podcast if you head over and give it a listen. <laughs> I'm actually really excited to show you a real life example of what Skillshare can do and what impact it can have. But of course, whether you're starting a podcast, a YouTube channel, picking up, I don't know, photography, writing, cooking, gardening, you're going to find something that you find interesting over on Skillshare. Even if you're unsure, it's a great place just to browse and have a look. So if you'd like to give Skillshare a go for yourself, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial to Skillshare's premium membership. And after that, it is only around $10 a month. But having said all of that, let's get into today's case. So we're heading back to the year of 2006 in Perth, Western Australia. There lived eight-year-old Sophia Rodriguez Uratia Shu. Sophia was born on November 11, 1997 to parents Gabriel and Josephine. And she also had three siblings, three-year-old Isabel, 11-year-old Inez and 14-year-old Gabriel. Along with their dog, Cookie, the family of seven, yes, I am including the dog, lived in the suburb of Canningvale, which is, from my limited knowledge of the area, a pretty family-friendly, safe, suburban-type neighborhood. Sophia's mother, Josephine, was a busy and hard-working, stay-at-home mum, as you can imagine, running after four young children, and father, Gabriel, ran the family business, which meant he was often away on business trips in Hong Kong. Sophia attended the Amater Christie Catholic Primary School, where she was well-liked by both her peers and her teachers, and she was described by those that knew her as happy, well-mannered, and gentle in nature. She also loved singing, dancing, and spending time with her two best friends, Georgia and Natalia. And she was at that wonderful, magical age where she still believed in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. <sighs> to be eight years old again, hey? <laughs> 
So now we're jumping ahead to Monday, June 26, which was a school day for Sophia and her two older siblings, Inez and Gabrielle. After school, Sophia's uncle picked herself and her siblings up and they all headed to the local shopping centre in Canningvale called Livingston Marketplace. Now, I've never been to Livingston Marketplace myself, despite living in Perth, but I get the idea from looking online that it's a relatively small shopping complex with not a lot of stores, not a lot of crowds, and not a lot going on. So, family-friendly neighborhood, small shopping center, it should be a place where you feel safe and confident to take your children after school. At the shops, Sophia, her uncle, and her siblings browse through Big W for a little while as Sophia excitedly tells her uncle all about an Indonesian dance routine that she had been picked to be part of at school. And by the way, Big W for any of my international listeners or viewers is somewhat similar to Kmart or Target. Soon, Sophia tells her uncle that she needs to use the toilet. So they head to the registers, and as they are checking out, Sophia's uncle tells her that she can walk across to the toilets by herself, located down a long corridor in sight of Big W. Her uncle watches as she walks across and down the corridor, lit by fluorescent lights, not knowing he would never see his niece alive again. And as it always seems to happen in cases like this, on this particular day, the CCTV outside of Big W wasn't working. So Sophia's vital last movements were never captured on video. In the meantime, her uncle and siblings finish checking out and go over to wait for Sophia outside of the corridor. Several more minutes pass and eventually her family decide to go down to the toilets to look for her to make sure that everything is okay. They call her name into the female toilets, no response. They call into the male toilets, no response. And then they try the disabled bathroom door, which was engaged. Gabriel knocks on the door and calls his sister's name, but when a male voice replies, he continues on. At this point, Sophia's family just figure that she was elsewhere in the shopping center. Maybe she'd walked out another exit, or maybe she'd missed her family altogether and was lost wandering around the shops. So as Gabriel waited outside the corridor, just in case Sophia returned, her family went searching for her. After about 10 minutes, Gabriel decides to go back down the corridor to the toilets and look for his sister just in case. And as he passes the disabled bathroom, the door suddenly unlocks and swings open. Out walked a pale, overweight, awkward looking man in about his early 20s. Gabriel locks eyes with this man for just a split second before peering into the now empty bathroom. There, 14-year-old Gabriel sees the lifeless and naked body of his baby sister lying on the ground. Her school uniform was discarded in the sanitary bin. Gabriel attempts to go after the male that had emerged from the bathroom just moments earlier, but this man was already hightailing it towards the exit, So instead of chasing after him, he runs to be by his sister's side before going to find his uncle. A search soon began for the perpetrator and the police were immediately called. Upon the police arriving, the entire shopping centre was closed down and declared a crime scene and remained as such until the following morning. And for the time being, the perpetrator had got away. What the police went on to discover would be named one of the most horrific and disturbing cases in Western Australia's history. Now, the following details are very upsetting, particularly as we are talking about a child. As always, I will not be going into any extreme detail, but I will be discussing Sophia's injuries, 
which are disturbing nonetheless. And if you are viewing this on YouTube, a timestamp will be on the screen for you now if you want to skip ahead. When Sophia was found, she was deceased, having died as a result of strangulation, done with such force that her larynx had been crushed. Both her legs had been broken, a result of extreme twisting, and both her arms were either dislocated or broken. Different sources said different things. She also had severe injuries resulting from sexual assault. The attack was said to last between three and five minutes, and it's unknown if the majority of her injuries, including the sexual assault, occurred before or after her death. Investigators believed that Sophia was either grabbed as she was walking past the disabled bathroom, or possibly as she walked in, somebody had been waiting in there, or as she walked out, somebody pushed her back in and locked the door behind them. Although her family aren't sure why she would have chosen the disabled bathroom, so possibly it happened as she was walking past. And whatever did happen, happened incredibly quick. And since nobody saw or heard any cries or screams, it's likely that the perpetrator strangled Sophia first, and she died or at least passed out very quickly. And at just eight years old, and already quite small for her age, Sophia never really stood a chance against her attacker. So an investigation immediately began, and it wasn't long before they were able to come up with a few promising suspects. In fact, it only took them a few hours, and one man in particular stood out. 21-year-old Dante Wyndham Arthurs, a pale, overweight fruit and vegetable packer that worked night fill at the Livingston Marketplace shopping centre, with a history of sexually assaulting young girls. He also happened to be at Livingston Marketplace running errands at the time that Sophia was killed. But the most damning thing of all, that had the investigation convinced that this just might be their guy, was an incident that happened just three years earlier, in the same suburb, Canning Vale, when Arthurs was just 19 years old. In 2003, Arthurs was arrested for the sexual assault of a young girl, but these charges would end up being dropped by the Director of Public Prosecutions, or DPP, because they had insufficient evidence to charge Arthurs, and also because police used improper interviewing techniques, which likely would have caused this case to be thrown out of court, leaving the DPP with no choice but to let Arthurs go. Now, I'm going to come back to this incident in just a moment, because as it would turn out, there was evidence, but in the end, poor police work unfortunately allowed a potentially dangerous man to walk free. And this begs the question, did the police mess up and have to let a man go that had now gone on to commit a murder? The day following Sophia's murder, at 5am, police paid a visit to Dante Arthurs, who lived with his parents just down the road from the Livingston Marketplace shopping centre. Arthurs was arrested and taken in for questioning as police searched his residence, where they uncovered some very disturbing and questionable items. Among them was a bag that had in it latex gloves, handcuffs, a knife, rope, and several pictures of young girls, with some of these images even including the girls' names, ages and home addresses, and directions on how to get there. Truly creepy. Sophia was not amongst these photos, by the way. Four hours later, Arthurs was charged with a willful murder, two counts of sexual penetration, and deprivation of liberty. So let's take a moment to discuss who Dante Arthurs was and a little about his upbringing. 
He was born on August 8, 1984, in Western Australia, but his family soon moved to England, where they spent eight years before returning to Australia. Early on in his life, Arthur's was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Now, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to have any real knowledge or understanding of Asperger's syndrome beyond what I've looked up on Google because I have absolutely no first-hand experience with it. But for context, I will read you verbatim the definition that healthdirect.gov.au gives on their website. Asperger's syndrome was the name given to a lifelong developmental disability that affects how people perceive the world and interact with others. Since 2013, people who have been described as having Asperger's syndrome have been described as having autism spectrum. There is no separate diagnosis for Asperger's anymore. All people with autism spectrum disorder have difficulties with social communication, fixated interests, and repetitive behavior. So the reason I'm even bringing this up at all is because it was something that was especially focused on when this case was being reported in the media. And just in case it is not clear, in no way am I excusing Arthur's for his actions, nor am I implying that those with Asperger's syndrome are bad or evil people. This is just a part of the case that I believe is relevant and needs to be mentioned when discussing it. Okay, so as I said, Arthur's was interviewed by police when he was arrested and during questioning, Arthur's didn't exactly deny his involvement, but he didn't confirm it either. He basically said he understood that he was the perpetrator, but he did not accept responsibility for these crimes, nor did he give any explanation as to why he committed such a horrendous crime. He also said that he could not remember whether the sexual assault had occurred before or after Sophia was killed, which may seem like somewhat of a moot point to bring up, But the thing is, and I only just recently learnt this myself, here in Western Australia, if you sexually assault someone after they're deceased, it doesn't count, meaning you cannot be charged with anything because the victim is not considered an anything anymore. I I can't even explain this in words. It's insane to me and it's offensive. I I thought something like this would come under interfering with a corpse at the very least. But here in Western Australia, no. Sexual assault after death simply does not count. Insane. Utterly insane. And you might remember that I mentioned before Arthur's was charged with two counts of sexual penetration. Well, if it could not be proven that Sophia was alive at the time of the assault, the charges would have to be dropped. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Later, Arthur's would go on to explain to his lawyers that although he could remember the murder, when he watched it in his head, it was as though someone else was committing the crime. And the reason that it ever even happened was all because that he had wanted to sexually touch a girl and he had never meant to kill anybody. Now back to the 2003 arrest for a moment involving the sexual assault of a young girl. Following Arthur's being arrested and charged with Sophia's murder, this case was reopened. And remember how I said that they didn't have sufficient evidence to charge him? Well, they had the evidence. They just did not test it. For some insane and to this day, unexplained reason, the shorts that Dante Arthurs wore during the assault that were in the possession of the police were never forensically tested. My mind is honestly blown again at this point. How lazy and just how 
irresponsible can an investigation be? So now it's 2006 and they finally test them. And lo and behold, small traces of the victim's blood are found on them. A key piece of evidence that likely would have secured Arthur's a conviction. Following this revelation, Sophia's family released a statement saying, quote, Had her killer been convicted for his earlier crimes? Had his name been added to a register of child sex offenders? Had Livingston Shopping Centre found out he had a criminal record? Sophia might be alive today. End quote. As you can imagine, it was an absolutely devastating realization for all involved. So you may remember me mentioning the James Bolger case at the start of this story and a rumor that connected that case to this one. If you're unfamiliar with that case though, here's a quick rundown. In 1993 in Liverpool, England, two-year-old James Patrick Bolger was at the local shopping centre with his mother, Denise. At 3.40pm, Denise became momentarily distracted and when her back was turned, two 10-year-old boys, Robert Thompson and John Venablaze, took James by the hand and led him away. Thomas and Venablaze went on to beat and torture little James before lying him across the train tracks and leaving him to be hit by a train. Although it is believed that James was deceased by the time he was placed on the tracks. So I've heard this case brought up and retold many times over the years and no matter how many times I hear it mentioned, the details of his murder still make me physically ill. Both 10-year-old boys were eventually arrested and charged with murder and tried as adults. After serving eight pathetic years, they were given new identities and relocated, at no expense of their own, of course. And this leads me to the connection to today's case. Many believed and still believe that Dante Arthurs is actually Robert Thompson. I mean, there certainly are some strange coincidences. These crimes are somewhat similar. The age of Arthurs and Thompson match up, both early 20s, and Arthurs did spend eight years living in England. Then there's the fact they both look freakishly similar. As you can imagine, the rumour mill went into overdrive, with people both locally and internationally speculating that Dante Arthurs was in fact Robert Thompson. But it wasn't long before the British High Commission and the Western Australian Police put a stop to the wild rumours, denying that Thompson and Arthurs were one in the same. Now, do I personally believe this rumour? No, not really, but I see how it could have been believable. I'll also have a photo of Thompson and Arthur's side by side on the screen and on my social media, so you can let me know your thoughts in the comments. In March of the following year, Dante Arthur's pled not guilty to all charges, but it wouldn't be long before the charges would be changed and Arthur's soon pled guilty to the lesser charge of murder, as opposed to willful murder. Now I'm about to put my law hat on, so bear with me for one moment as I fumble through and pretend to understand criminal law and the justice system. So from my understanding, and correct me if I am wrong, the definition of a willful murder here in Western Australia is to kill someone with intent to kill, as opposed to just murder, that is to kill someone with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, but not death. Mind you, willful murder no longer even exists in Western Australia, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. So back to Arthur's and his charge dropping from willful murder to murder, as it could not really be proven that he intended to kill Sophia, 
it was in their best interest to go with the lesser charge of murder. In other words, if they had proceeded with the willful murder charge, there was a risk of Arthur's being found not guilty and walking free. It's also worth noting that, once again, the police used improper interviewing techniques during this investigation. Therefore, none of the interviews they had with Arthurs relating to the murder could be used to gain a conviction. So, in the end, along with pleading guilty to murder, he also pled guilty to deprivation of liberty and the other charges of sexual penetration were dropped. As you may remember, we discussed earlier, sexual assault apparently doesn't count if a victim is deceased, and in this case, they could not prove if Sophia had been alive or dead when the assault occurred. Therefore, they were forced to drop this charge. It's honestly as though this monster was able to commit the most awful, heinous crime imaginable. Yet under local 2006 laws, Dante Arthurs managed to get away with almost all of it through one loophole or another. So because Arthurs pled guilty, there was no trial and he was eventually sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of just 13 years, plus two for deprivation of liberty. To add context to this pathetic sentence, back in 2006, the minimum sentence for murder here in Western Australia was just seven years. Yes, you heard correct seven for murder, with a maximum of just 14, meaning Arthur's actually got pretty close to the maximum penalty for what he did, believe it or not. For willful murder, 15 was the minimum and 30 was the max, if you were curious. But since this case, and in a large part because of this case, The laws have thankfully changed. The minimum sentence for murder is now 10 years and as of 2008, the term willful murder has been eliminated. We now only have murder and manslaughter. However, if you committed a crime pre-2008, the old laws apply, I do believe. I honestly only say this based on the fact that the Claremont serial killer, Bradley Edwards, was charged with willful murder just last year for crimes dating back to the 90s. And the other major change that Western Australia made was getting rid of maximum non-parole periods, so now judges can set them as high as they feel fit, including the option to set a sentence of never to be released. So quite a few fantastic changes made there that make me incredibly happy as a local. And for anyone new to the Aussie justice system, we do not have the death penalty here and we have not for a very long time. I also want to add in here a friendly reminder. I'm not a lawyer, clearly. (laughs) So if I have any of these laws wrong, kindly correct me. There certainly were a few points I was confused on and polite corrections are always welcome. Post-trial, it came out that Dante Arthur's sexual assaults dated back even further than 2003. It was revealed that in 2001, while on holidays with his family, Arthur's was arrested for sexually assaulting a young girl in Surrey, England, and had been under investigation by the British police. But no charges had ever been laid. And because the assault happened internationally, local police were never informed. Just another example of Dante Arthurs slipping through the cracks of the system and getting away with his crimes. Believe it or not, Dante Arthurs was applicable for parole by 2019. And as you can imagine, the local community were in an uproar about it. A former local police officer, Paul Litherland, decided to do something about it. 
starting a petition to keep Arthur's behind bars that eventually gained over 120,000 signatures. And thankfully, when the time came, Dante Arthur's was denied parole. And although he is able to apply again next year, 2022, from my understanding, there is a very, very small chance that Dante Arthur's will ever be a free man. Of course, this isn't much relief for the Rodriguez Uritaya Shu family, who will have to continue to relive this nightmare at least every three years for the foreseeable future. In the years following, Sophia's family fought for several local changes that would hopefully prevent another family having to suffer like they had. One of these was the introduction of an online public sex offender registry, and in 2012, this finally became a reality for Western Australian residents. Which is the perfect time to remind you that if you do have access to a local registry, look up offenders in your area and be aware of who you're living near. It's free and easy and just another way that you can keep yourself and your family safe. However, the frustrating thing about this is, if Arthur's is ever to be released, he won't even be added to the public sex offender register because the sexual penetration charges were dropped. Of course, I will keep you updated with any more updates regarding this case on my socials or the community tab, but I do want to thank you for listening to Sophia's story today, and a very special thank you to my channel members, my shining stars. But until next time, stay vigilant, stay safe, and I will see you very soon. Bye guys.